What if I told you that everything you knew about mass murders and mass shootings is wrong? What if I told you there was an uncomfortable link between the intelligence agencies and these killers? What if the FBI knew about these men and what they were going to do and refused to stop them? What if isn't the right question, though. It's really how much did they know and for how long? After every mass shooting, the left-wing rhetoric starts up. Well, other countries don't have these sorts of problems with guns. And I'd answer that with, those other countries don't have the CIA, the FBI, and the DHS. To start, let's look at Nicholas Cruz, the shooter in Parkland, Florida, who took the lives of 17 people. After his mom died, his extreme and violent behavior escalated, and a woman close to him filed a report with the FBI. They said he was thrown out of schools for violent behavior. Quote, he's thrown out of all these schools because he would pick up a chair and just throw it at somebody, a teacher or a student, because he didn't like the way they were talking to him. She described his mental state. He's only 18, but he's got the mental capacity of a 12 to a 14-year-old. She described how he used to talk of killing himself, but had recently changed to talking of killing other people. She also told them that he had used his mother's money to buy weapons, ammo, and body armor after she died. His Instagram reflected that. I just want someone to know about this so they can look into it, and if they think it's something worth going into, fine. If not, I just know I have a clear conscience if he takes off and just starts shooting places up. That wasn't the only tip the FBI had received about Nicholas Cruz. He had been commenting on YouTube, and that was reported to the FBI, when he said that he wanted to be a professional school shooter. The local police had received 45 calls from the neighborhood in regards to the Cruz family over the past 10 years leading up to the shooting. In fact, Cruz himself called the police and told them he was a mental mess after the death of his mother. People constantly called the police, warning them that Cruz was obsessed with his guns and wanting to use them on other people. And, on top of all of this, he was staying in the house of a military intelligence analyst at the time. And yet, despite all of that, Nicholas Cruz was allowed to go on and murder 17 people. Let's look at a failed attempt by the FBI to activate a shooter. But it will give us a glimpse into how they prevent terrorism. His name was Khalil Abu Rayyan. He was a 21-year-old pizza delivery man, depressed and developing more extreme lines of thinking. He'd been in trouble for most of his life. At the age of 12, he started counseling after telling his teacher about a nightmare he'd had where he brought a gun to school and shot the place up. In 2014, he started watching ISIS videos, posting pictures and comments online that made him look like a tough Islamic warrior and that put him on the FBI's radar. But in reality, he was suicidal and desperate. A person reached out to him on Twitter, supposedly a Pakistani woman named Gada, and they quickly fell in love. Within days, they were planning on getting married, and he started setting up a date for them to meet in real life. When that happened, she stopped responding to messages. Two days later, another woman messaged him, named Jana. She wasn't strictly interested in getting married. She wanted to go out with a bang. Rayan again fell in love almost instantly. Remember, he's not a vicious terrorist. He's a depressed loser who was trying to act tough to gain respect. With all this new female attention, he loses the act pretty quickly. But Jana had other plans. She wanted to be a martyr for Islam. Here are some messages they shared back and forth. It's like I knew you all my life, wrote Rayan. I will ask you to marry me, but not now. Please don't rush me, wrote Jana. I'm depressed and very scared. Jana said she dreamed of committing a suicide attack with Rayan as an expression of undying love. I'm not crazy, Khalil, Jana wrote. It's my Iman, faith. It's what I believe in. Jihad is my dream. Honestly, you need to think about what you want, Rayan replied. I can't be in this game. Rayan wasn't that into the idea of violent jihad as an expression of spiritual love. He repeatedly told Jana that she should rethink her plans and marry him instead. They could be happy. They could start a family. Don't do anything that will hurt yourself or other people, he wrote. He later added, depression is real, but don't let it run your life. As Rayan tried to convince Jana that martyrdom was a foolish choice, he confessed to her that he had struggled with violent thoughts himself. 
He said he wanted to kill the cop who had pulled him over for speeding. He claimed, falsely, that there was a sword in his car. He blustered that he had once contemplated shooting up a church near his pizza shop and that he didn't intend to spare the women and children. It's one of the biggest churches in Detroit. I had it planned out. I bought a bunch of bullets. I practiced a lot with the gun. I practiced reloading and unloading. But my dad searched my car one day and he found everything. He found the guns and bullets and a mask I was going to wear. It would have been a bloodbath, but everything happens for a reason. I don't know what the future leads. Maybe down the line I can try again. Weeks of desperate messages to Jana culminated with a foreboding phone conversation. Rand told her that he had purchased a rope to hang himself. Only in like a minute or two, it'll be over, said Rand. My family is going to be sad for a little while, but they'll get over it. Jana responded that the only proper way for Muslims to kill themselves is in an act of violent jihad. Like I told you before, when it's for the sake of Allah, when it's jihad, when it's based on our creed or for a cause, that's the only time Allah allows it, said Jana. But not to put your life to waste and just hang yourself like you say you want to do, that's not the right thing to do. Later in the conversation, Rayan said that he did not want to hurt anybody else. He was interested in taking only his own life. If I did it to myself, it would be easier, said Rayan. I wouldn't get in trouble. I'm not trying to get arrested again. Jonna was actually an undercover FBI agent, and we still don't know what intelligence agency the first woman to reach out to him worked for. Two days later, he was arrested for unlawful possession of a firearm, even though that gun had been confiscated from him months earlier during a traffic stop, and he owned no other weapons. But this gives us an insight into how these conversations with the feds really go. Consider the case of Garland, Texas shooter Elton Simpson, who killed two people, who received this message from an undercover FBI agent just days before the shooting. Tear up Texas. The same agent was even there taking pictures just before the shooting. He took this photo just 30 seconds before the shooting began, and then fled once it started. So, it's just a big coincidence that the same person who happens to be a Fed, who encouraged the shooter, just happens to be there when the shooting happened. Over and over, we see a trend of the Feds and local authorities having full knowledge and yet do nothing, and often encourage the shooter along the way. The Buffalo shooter, Peyton Gendron, who killed 10 people at a grocery store, was frequently messaging a retired federal agent in the run-up to the day of the shooting, including just 30 minutes before. The shooter in Boulder, Colorado, who in March killed 10 people, was known to the FBI. The shooter in Indianapolis in April, who shot and killed 8 people, was interviewed by the FBI the previous year when his own mom reported him. Esteban Santiago Ruiz complained to the FBI directly at their office in Alaska that the CIA was making him watch ISIS beheading videos and that he was hearing voices. A few months later, he shot up Fort Lauderdale Airport, killing five people. Omar Mateen, who was responsible for the Pulse nightclub shooting that killed 50 people, he was investigated by the FBI twice, and even his dad was an informant for the FBI for the past 10 years. The FBI intercepted and subsequently ignored the emails of Nadal Hassan, who was the shooter in the Fort Hood shooting, where 13 people were killed and more than 30 were wounded. One federal agent suspects he was a CI because of the failure of the FBI to pursue or investigate him any further. James Holmes was convinced the FBI was surveilling him while he was planning the Aurora Theater shooting and that they would swoop in and stop him from killing 12 people and wounding almost 60 others. But that never happened. The FBI refuses to confirm or deny that they were surveilling him. The mother of the Sandy Hook shooter, who killed 26 people, 20 of whom were children, used to brag to her neighbors that her son had made it to the FBI's attention when he was only in ninth grade. He had tried to hack into the government's computer system and made it past the first two layers, but couldn't get past a third. When the FBI or CIA, she couldn't really remember which one it was, visited them at their house, they said her son was extremely smart and might end up working for them someday. Elliot Rogers, who killed his three roommates and three others, was in contact with local authorities in the month leading up to his massacre. The DHS knew about the San Jose shooter, Samuel Cassidy, who killed nine people. 
Dylan Roof, who shot up a black church, killing nine people, had a drug charge which activated an FBI background check on him when he tried to purchase a gun, so he was on their radar. J.T. Reddy killed his girlfriend and three others, including a toddler, while he was already under a current investigation by the FBI. Fraser Glenn Miller Jr., a former KKK member who was living under a fake ID he received from the FBI for being an informant, killed three people in Kansas City. He was also a Green Beret during Vietnam, so I'm sure nothing suspicious is going on there, and he was also present at the Greensboro Massacre. Faoud Abdu Ahmed took three hostages and killed two people at a bank in Louisiana months earlier. He had been interviewed by the FBI and DHS. He told them a device had been planted in his brain that was causing voices in his head. John Allen Muhammad, otherwise known as the DC sniper, who killed 10 people, was reported to the FBI three different times by three different people. The FBI dismissed the reports and refused to investigate him as they said the reports weren't compelling enough. William Atchison, who shot up his high school in New Mexico, killing two people, was a known threat to his high school, the local police, and to the FBI. The FBI visited his home in person after he had made threatening remarks online about potentially shooting up his school. When they showed up, he said that he wasn't the type of person to actually do that stuff. He was just all talk. And the FBI agreed. The lawyer representing the victim's mother said this, The FBI failed to conduct the type of investigation that a federal law enforcement agency is expected to conduct. The school district knew that they had a potential threat and they chose to ignore it. And the police department, when told about this potential threat, chose not to investigate it. And a tragedy resulted. That's a perfect summary to the examples I've provided in this video. Using... 9-11 9-11 as a pretext to build the world's biggest panopticon to spy on us with, the federal government has done just that through its intelligence agencies and surveillance programs. And for what? To prevent terrorism? To prevent domestic attacks? All we have is missed attack after missed attack. In just the examples I provided, we have almost 200 people who died from preventable deaths. Even when you get rid of the spine and simply just report a dangerous person to them, they consistently fumble the ball. And that's giving them the benefit of the doubt that they're even trying to stop these events. Over and over, we see that the feds are not only monitoring terrorism or domestic threats, they're actually the ones planning the attacks and then encouraging people into doing them. From the plot to kidnap Wisconsin Governor Gretchen Whitmer, which was led by a man the FBI called Captain Autism, to the January 6th insurrection, which had a lot of federal agents snooping around that day, to the Oklahoma City bombing, to ISIS, to Al-Qaeda, you name it. The feds are always present to instigate and inflame, to fund and to arm, to plot and to encourage. I'll leave you with the wise words of David McGowan, who I wish was with us now more than ever. This is a quote from an article he wrote in 2001 about the Columbine High School shooting. I would highly encourage you all to go and read it. The strategy is now, as it was then, to inflict blunt force trauma on all of American society, and by doing so to destroy any remaining sense of community and instill in the people deep feelings of fear and distrust, of hopelessness and despair, of isolation and powerlessness. And the results have been, it should be stated, rather spectacular. With each school shooting and each act of domestic terrorism, the social fabric of the country is ripped further asunder. The social contracts that bound us together as people with common goals, common dreams, and common aspirations have been shattered. We have been reduced to a nation of frightened and disempowered individuals, each existing in our own little sphere of isolation and fear. At the same time, we have been desensitized to the ever-rising levels of violence in society. This is true of both interpersonal violence as well as violence by the state, in the form of judicial executions, spiraling levels of police violence, and the increased militarization of foreign policy and of America's borders. We have become, in the words of the late George Orwell, a society in which the prevailing mental condition is controlled insanity. And under these conditions, it becomes increasingly difficult for the American people to fight back against the supreme injustice of 21st century Western society. 
which of course is precisely the point. This whole video was inspired by Boltzmann Booty on Twitter and his thread where he laid all this stuff out. So please go give him a follow and I give him full credit for doing the work and research that hardly anybody is doing. While you're at it, go follow BTH Bill and Jimmy Fallon Gong for all your parapolitics and esoterica needs. That's all the time I have for today. If you enjoyed this video and type of content that I'm making, please consider giving this video a like and maybe subscribing. I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.